look, you may notice they removed the screen. I am not going to show you clips. I'm not going to show you PowerPoint slides. And I know that this is fatal, right? <laughs> uh, but I, I, since I'm not talking about any particular film at length, that would have been a lot of work and probably, as uh, has already been indicated, violate copyright regulation somewhere. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just prattle at you. Now, Andy mentioned that we do a weekly science radio show, an hour show, Big Picture Science. I encourage you to look it up if you're interested in science. If you're not, I wonder why you're sitting here. But <laughs> uh, there's Seth's rule. I, I fight with my producer all the time about this. How long should you interview somebody? So you got somebody who's you know, modestly interesting, maybe some researcher who's investigating something of, uh, shall we say, small interest to many people, like, I don't know, the cure for death. Okay. And, and Molly will say, you know, that's kind of interesting. Maybe we ought to let it run long, which, by which she means 10 minutes. And I say, no, there's a seven-minute rule. After seven minutes of listening to some guy just prattling at them, people's eyeballs glaze over like Krispy Kremes, so stop it at seven minutes. Uh, we don't often do that because she's the boss, but I, I know that that's what's going to happen here. Uh, there's also the aesthetic offense. Because I don't have a screen for you to look at, you know, there's the aesthetic offense of looking at me. So I would encourage any of you who feel the inclination to do so, just rotate your chairs 180 degrees, and at least you won't have to suffer that. Uh, and in fact, this reminds me of something that was told to me just before a talk I had to give at NASA Ames Research Center. Several, it's not mine, but whatever it is, I think it controls downtown Houston. OK. Um, that could be good. Yeah. I was giving this talk at NASA Ames, and I was kind of nervous about it because it was a subject matter about which I knew nothing, which is rather similar to tonight. And, and the, the woman who had arranged it said, look, Seth, don't worry. She said, 10% of the audience will actually pay enough attention to be able to ask you know, relevant questions at the end. Another 10% will occasionally pay attention just enough to be able to ask irrelevant questions, and the remainder will just be sitting there having sexual fantasies. <laughs> so I hope that that's the case here. That's all. OK, now, let me just say about, something about science and sci-fi. Um, they're usually only discussed, I mean, it's a very popular topic now. I think uh, Neil Tyson has just been discussing it recently as well. There's some seats over here, if you dare. OK. Um, there, there are only two aspects of science and science fiction that seem to be routinely discussed. And the first is how sci-fi has managed to predict. Im Sorry. That's OK. That one's wired for 50,000 volts. OK. How, sci how science fiction has managed to predict science, usually not science, usually technology, right? The canonical example being your cell phone. That was, you know, Kirk out, right? Oop. That was the. Uh, you know, the, the Star Trek communicators. Now, uh, down uh, about 10 miles from where I live, I live in this Silicon Valley, Mountain View, California. Uh, down in San Jose, there's a guy by the name of Marty Cooper, and he is the guy who actually did invent the cell phone. And I asked him about that, because we were at a Star Trek convention. I said, Marty, you must have taken inspiration from, you know, William Shatner there. And he said, no, we had a prototype of that thing five years before that series even aired. He said, it's nothing, and you know, it was a big thing, of course, didn't look like what they look like now. He said, it weighed about 20 pounds and the battery life was like 20 minutes. But he said, <laughs> but he said it didn't matter. With 20 pounds, after 20 minutes, you want to put it down anyhow. But, <laughs> but apparently, uh, uh, in a conversation with Andre Bormanis, who advises on a lot of films, he said, yeah, that may be true, Seth. He said, but what they did get from Star Trek was the flip action. Right? He said that was taken from Star Trek. So uh, Star Trek has been important in industrial design. I don't know if that, that's terribly important. So uh, that's the one thing that, that people talk about in science and science fiction. And the other thing is the endless fun they have pointing out, see, they were pressing it. They, they, they saw there might be planets around other stars. Or see, that's completely stupid. They got that wrong. That's much more fun. And I suspect that many of, the, of my predecessors in this series have done that. They, they take a film, they sort of take it apart. Uh, this is right, but that's wrong, and that kind of thing. And that's fun, but I'm not going to do that, because I don't want you to have too much fun tonight. Um, <laughs> there, there's an, by the way, if you point out things that you know, they predicted correctly, I mean, there's an element of confirmation bias in that. Right? I mean, it doesn't prove that they're necessarily prescient. It just proves that some of the time, they happen to get it right. I mean, even Flash Gordon might have gotten some things right. Uh, so you know, I, I don't know. But mistakes. Uh, I will talk about some mistakes simply because they are so interesting. 
but I also hope to say something more about whether there's anything in any of this that's meaningful in any way, or is it just a fun topic? I, I fear that it may be the latter, but I'm, I'm going to try and establish the former. Okay, so let's talk a, few, a little bit about some of the obvious errors. Uh, Sci-fi films often contain real howlers. I'm not talking about White Fang. Uh, I mean, if you go to the internet, nobody remembers White Fang. If you go to the internet movie database, I am B, and you look under any film, you know, goofs. There's a whole section goofs. And, and there, you know, some, some of them was looking up Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It just pages and pages. It was longer than the script for the film, right? <laughs> All these goofs. You know, oh, the, the coordinates they gave for Devil's Tower in Wyoming, completely wrong, 300 miles to the west. That kind of thing. Uh, but most of them don't have very much to do with the science. Most of them are continuity goofs. You know, in this scene, you know, his, his shirt is open, and the next shot is shirt is closed, or whatever, that kind of thing. Uh, so those are, those are just production errors, and they're not much about the science. And maybe that just points out the fact that most of the audience is not interested in the science. Nonetheless, there is something about the science that surely intrigues people. Here are some canonical examples. Not necessarily my favorite, but the most obvious being when the Starship door prize zooms by the camera, right, in Star Trek, and you hear whoosh, right? Okay. Everybody knows they're wrong. But if they leave it out, they know this. If you leave it out, you know, people start storming the projector room. Hey, so your sound cut out, right? So the, the X-wing fighters, they have to have the whoosh when they go by. Or here's something. Uh, you see this on TV all the time. You know, there's some surveillance video that's caught something important, right? And zoom in on that, Bob, right? And, and they can zoom up. You know, well, we're up to 427x. And, you know, it's getting bigger and bigger. Now I can see every ward on the guy's face, right? Even though he was across the, the street and it's night. That you can zoom in as much as you want. Anybody who does digital photography knows that's nuts. Uh, Jeff Goldblum can upload a virus into an alien computer and save the planet. <laughs> You can hardly do that with a contemporary computer well, that you've made. <laughs> uh, aliens, here's another obvious one. Aliens who look like us, bipedal, four appendages, a head, two eyes. Uh, in fact, usually the only difference is their foreheads are bumpy. Okay, that, that's kind of it. Yeah, right. You, can, you must be an alien. Huh? Right. So there, there's no selection effect for smooth foreheads. <laughs> Does it keep the rain out of your eyes? What, is it, what are those bumps? <laughs> and of course, they will all speak colloquial English. And not just colloquial English. It's not colloquial English from 1850 or even 1890. It's colloquial English from today. These guys are very well schooled. Um, how about this? A virus from space will immediately and fatally take out, of all, take out all of Earth's flora and fauna. Right? It is, you know, the Andromeda strain it just sort of descends on the Earth. And even though it, it's never seen DNA before, right? it has not interacted for 4 billion years with DNA, like all the things that make you sick, Right? Suddenly, everybody starts dying. At least the top of the food chain starts dying. Or how about this? You can build a high-speed tunneling contraption to take yourself and a bunch of buddies to the core of the Earth without <laughs> suffering a gooey meltdown. I, you know, a lot of the geologists said, I want one of those. <laughs> I, you know, I, I note the obvious, which is usually my tenor. I note the obvious that this preoccupation with sci-fi boners doesn't extend to other film genres, right? You can go see a Donald Duck cartoon, and I don't see a lot of people complaining, hey, look, you know, real ducks don't speak English and have the same <laughs> social lives we do. And beyond that, why is it that all these cartoon characters, their last name is always their species name? <laughs> Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny. You know, hey, it's Ralph Human. I mean, <laughs> the, or, <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm almost tempted to say something about Goofy. Right? This mouse has a dog as a pet, right? But also his best friend, no, that's his best friend, Goofy, who's a dog. But then his pet is Pluto. He's also a dog. Just one gets to talk and the other doesn't. Cowboys. Cowboys are shooting one another over horse thievery. But nobody seems to point out that in reality, in reality, these guys are in the hamburger production business. And it's probably not nearly as glamorous as uh, you know, what you see in the films. It was probably you know, just kind of dull work. And most of the got, uh, bad guys in the real Old West were pimply-faced teenagers who took a bath maybe once a month, right? Okay, well, I mean, that's probably still true of bad guys today. But, and then, then the, my five favorite character was the rancher that they would occasionally run across, you know, some windswept, godforsaken place where you couldn't grow anything. Right? So there's this rancher here, and he's a gnarled old guy. But he's got a beautiful daughter. <laughs> no wife, but a beautiful daughter. And you kind of wonder, what sort of genetic mistake happened here. Right? <laughs> How'd that happen? Okay. 
So, all right, so there's all this, but nobody's complaining about any of that. That's all okay. It was sci-fi, they complain. Now why? Why do we hold sci-fi to a higher standard, as Nanner Schiffers would say? Well, maybe it's because it pretends to be prescriptive. We're, right, we're, we're watching for the prognostication as much as the tension. And so if something is implausible, right, uh, there's some violation of natural law. I think that we feel like we had just caught a Las Vegas dealer, you know, doing something underhanded, cheating somehow. Uh, a lot of these complaints, I think, are over the top. There's a certain degree of schadenfreude in this. Uh, and I think it's because, you know, a lot of you are very well schooled in science. And so it's a way to feel superior to those guys who are earning, you know, 30 times as much as you are in driving fancy cars, <laughs> right? Because they got the science wrong. So I, I think there is something to this. Uh, it's a bit perverse, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and really from a logical point of view, I mean, arguing about these technical details, you don't see the classicist arguing a lot about, I don't know, uh, Gladiator, right? In Gladiator, there's a padlock on a door. Well, padlocks weren't invented until the 19th century. It's like, all right, that's it. I'm not going to believe this anymore, right? <laughs> or or uh, in the Ten Commandments, somebody's wearing a watch. You know, <laughs> they don't complain. Let me point out to you another thing that's interesting about sci-fi films, sci-fi cinema, because people talk about sci-fi as if it's all one thing. But if you're really into sci-fi, and some of you may be into the real sci-fi, which is written sci-fi, that's, you know, the pure sci-fi, <laughs> that people into written sci-fi have nothing but disdain from what they, for what they see at the local cineplex, because the stories at the local cineplex, unlike written sci-fi, are very shallow, very simple, Right? I mean, they have to be somewhat simpler because you only have a, two hours, whereas in a book you can do more things. And in, in a movie you always have to show stuff. In a, in a book you can describe stuff. So, you know, it's a different kind of genre, but it's, it's often said that the, the people who are really sci-fi aficionados, they have nothing but contempt for cinema sci-fi. Yet, there is the other side of the coin. And that is the number of people who are seriously into sci-fi, that is, who will buy a book by, I don't know, David Brin or something like that, uh, Gregory Benford, something like that, that's maybe 1% of the reading population. But for movies, for sci-fi movies, it, that isn't 1% of the movie public. That's a very large fraction of the movie public. And in fact, if you look at the 10 biggest grossing films of all time, you have to adjust for inflation, but I've done that. If you do that, then three of the 10 were sci-fi, right? Avatar, E.T., Star Wars. Right? So sci-fi is a mass market product. And yeah, maybe it's not sci-fi, but it's better than sci-fi, right? Better than the real sci-fi. I feel, feel obliged to say something about Avatar. Everybody see Avatar? Yeah. All right, so they, so they go to this moon of Pandora around some godforsaken planet. And to do what? To bring back the unobtainium. Pretty, pretty clever. <laughs> Name that. <laughs> Where is it on the periodic chart, Ralph? OK. Now, I don't, I don't tell you, it was unclear what it did. I guess it made things fluid. I mean, it had some value. But they actually, in the film, they tell you how much it's worth per kilo. I forgot what the number is, but I, I, I knew at the time. You know, I don't have millions of dollars per kilo for this stuff. But they also tell you in the film, this is their mistake, they also tell you how long it took the rockets to get there, right, and, and how far away it was. So you knew how fast the rockets had to go. So I just did the calculation how much energy it would take those rockets to bring back a kilo of unobtainium, right? And, you know, and then I figured, all right, the energy, let's say they can buy it for the same price you can buy energy for, one, uh, for here in the Houston area. I say 10 cents a kilowatt hour, let's say. Right? And then it turned out that bringing unobtainium back from Pandora was about as sensible as ordering a book from Amazon and paying $30,000 for the shipping. <laughs> Nobody was impressed. But I, OK, so let me say uh, a little bit about cinema sci-fi then, rather than just continue to make jokes here. I'm not going to make any more jokes. Um, <laughs> Most people will say sci-fi is just, you know, ordinary drama, but it's set in space. But I, I, that's not a very good definition, I don't think. If it is set in space, is it necessarily sci-fi? How many saw Gravity? Gravity. You guys have a small problem. That we, Houston may have a problem. Was that sci-fi? I'm not sure it was sci-fi. To me, it was not really sci-fi. I mean, it, nobody cares, but it didn't seem like sci-fi. According to John Baxter, who wrote a book many years ago about science fiction, Science fiction cinema really only has two themes. There are only two themes. This is, and they were probably invented by the Greeks. But you know, the first of these is loss of identity. Daddy isn't daddy anymore, right? And this is a primal fear, right? If you're a kid and one of your parents is suddenly 
not there in the way they normally are, that's, you know, that's scary. I mean, that could be fatal for you, right? So loss of identity. Think of the invasion of the body snatchers. That's the obvious one. Invasion of the body snatchers. Uh, close encounters of the third kind. Remember when Dickie Dreyfus is there at the dinner table with his kids, you know, mounding up his mashed potatoes into a Devil's Tower monument there. And, you know, they're looking at him and saying, don't worry, kids, daddy's still daddy. No, he isn't. Okay, so there's that. Uh, none of you, well, some of you may remember it was a film <laughs> called I Married a Monster from Outer Space. This did not win too many Academy Awards, but it was, it was, it was kind of an interesting film because it was a young ingenue, and she marries this guy, but, you know, on their wedding night, it turns out he's not who she thought he was, right? He's a monster from outer space. So loss of identity, that's one theme. And the other theme, which is much more frequently used, is... There are some things man was not meant to know, <laughs> right? It's kind of anti-science, really, but uh, that's what it is. So that's, you know, that's, that's hubris. That's hubris. Uh, so it, you know, if you try and, and, and learn things that you really shouldn't know, you will be squashed, okay? The threat of knowledge. Now, that led to the whole creature feature cycle in the 1950s. Uh, there, were, there were films there like, uh, well, one of my favorites was Them, Them. Very, busy, very simple film. You know, you know it's, it's Nevada. They're having a nuclear test, which is what they did on the weekends in Nevada. And near the, near the test site, there was this ant hill, right? And the bomb goes off, bam. And then all the ants mutate simultaneously all in the same direction. Anybody who's taken high school biology will be suspect of this, but they did. And so you got ants that were eight feet high at the shoulder. Um, and then they invade the sewers of Los Angeles. I don't know if you're an eight-foot high ant. That's probably the first thing that comes to mind. I, I, and, and, and I will say that, you know, from the point of view of those of us living in the, the Bay Area, Northern California, we thought this was a perfectly good thing. Because <laughs> after all, L.A. had it coming. I mean, it was, it was sort of, you know, backing up the sewers in L.A. I mean, it was, all right, so they, they sent various uh, heroes down there to battle the ants. A lot of uh, Los Angelinos got, you know, formic acid poisoning in the process. Okay, so that, but that's, see, you shouldn't tamper with atomic bombs. There's some things you weren't meant to know, okay? So other suggestions there, alien, you know, don't land on that planet there. There's something there biological that's going to take over your ship, right, and maybe more. Right? Or Colossus, the Forbin project, right? The military builds this big thinking machine, and then it realizes there's another big thinking machine in the Soviet Union. I want to get in touch. You know, maybe we can play games of free sale together or whatever they were going to do, right? And, of course, that leads to disaster. Don't tamper. Nope. No hubris. All right. Uh, but in all these things, you notice that we're not talking about character development. We're not even talking about very much action in general. I mean, today, there's a lot of sci-fi. It's all action. But they're not even really sci-fi in many ways. They're just shoot 'em ups Kingsley Amos, the famous uh, British uh, novelist, made this point. He said, in sci-fi, the idea is the hero. It isn't the characters, it's the idea. Unfortunately, there aren't too many <laughs> heroes in today's sci-fi films. Okay. All right, let me, uh, let me just go through a couple of gaps before getting on to what may be the limited meat of this uh, presentation. This is actually a vegan presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, no, no meat. Okay, uh, and, and, and just talk about some of my favorite gaps. I like to do this, by the way. I, I've written, I don't know, 10 or 15 movie reviews for Huffington Post and Space.com and places like that. And what I do is I just point out all the errors, you know, but in a humorous way, of course, to try and make it a little less uh, obvious what I'm doing. And it's a cheap thrill, and I like it. Um, easy thing to do. It's like making critical restaurant reviews on Yelp. Everybody loves to read them, right? But it's the same deal. Here are a couple of my fir uh, favorites. The, uh, the insects I mentioned in them, these eight foot high at the shoulder ants, but that isn't all. Uh, Paul Verhoeven, a Dutch uh, director, made Starship Troopers, I don't know, 15 years ago. Right, so, and he knows nobody likes bugs. I mean, if you're an entomologist, maybe you like, if you're E.O. Wilson, maybe you like bugs. But most people don't like bugs, right? So if they don't like bugs, bugs are pretty small. If you don't like small bugs, you really won't like big bugs. So, so he, the aliens are these giant insects, right? They, they are pretty disgusting. Uh, but of course, they wouldn't work. Those of you who remember, what was it, 11th grade, no, 10th grade biology, will know that bugs have an exoskeleton, right? So they're not very strong structurally. And if you take a bug, right, and you make him 10 foot higher, right, well, now his muscles have a cross-section that's 10 by 10, 
that's 100 times greater. So that bug is indeed 100 times stronger. The only difficulty is he's 10 by 10 by 10. He's 1,000 times heavier. So his power to weight ratio just went down by a factor of 10. So if you take a bug and you scale him up to whatever they were in Starship Jupiter like that, he will just collapse immediately into a hunk of unappealing goo. Right? <laughs> so that's, that's not going. Um, there was a time when I was a grad student, uh, Andy's already mentioned, I was at Caltech. And uh, one, one evening, they advertised one of the writers for Star Trek was going to come to the campus. So I went. And there were like five other guys there. They were undergrads. I was a grad student. And, uh, you know, this guy was just, he was a writer. So he was talking about how they came up with the various plots. He pointed out, you know, well, actually, uh, Nemoy's ears are real. Shatner's ears are fake. And I don't know. He was, he was just making jokes. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the undergraduates asked him, he said, all right, I, I, what I want to know is, how fast is warp speed? You have warp one, warp two, warp three, right? And so the writer says, well, it's very simple. He said, warp one is the speed of light. It's pretty good. Warp two is the speed of light squared. Warp three is the speed of light cubed. <laughs> At this point, my inductive abilities were enough to figure out what the rest was. But see, I was a grad student. The, the smart ones were the undergrads. And one of the undergrads said, OK, what if I define the speed of light as one light year per year? So you're saying warp two is one times one, and warp three is one times one times one. <laughs> it's dimensionally incorrect. And I thought, oh, these guys actually are smart. <laughs> and, and at that point, the visitor just threw up the sands. He said, hey, look, man, I'm just a writer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so they fixed that. They fixed that. If you're still into Star Trek, you can buy a book, right, that has all the you know, the descriptions of, I, I had to read it once because I, ga I gave a course once on Star Trek science up at a museum. And it's very hard to read this stuff because it's all nonsense, right? How the phasers work and all this stuff. And well, the Vibel Fetzer is connected to the Flybel Weitzer and then, you know, you put in the energy. Whatever. It didn't make any sense. But they've, they've specified it all so that the writers, of course, can get it right. Okay. Um, at one point, I was so put off by some of the very egregious errors in the original Star Trek that I wrote Gene Roddenberry. See, it was still a small, film, uh, small show back then. I wrote him a letter, and I said, look, look, Gene. Can I call you Gene? I said, Gene, uh, you know, there are a lot of very elementary science errors in these, these scripts. So I'll tell you what. You pay my bus fare over to Burbank every two weeks, and I'll come over and redline the scripts for you. I won't change the storyline. I'll just fix the obvious science errors, OK? And he wrote back, because back then, you know, nobody was watching the show anyhow. And, <laughs> and I remember my roommate said, you got a letter back from Roddenberry? I said, I did. So, he said, so he's looking over my shoulders. I open it up, and he dear Mr. Child. He said, uh, actually, uh, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, we've already got the RAND Corporation doing this for us. And the RAND Corporation, for those of you who don't know, is a think tank down in Santa Monica that was worried about nuclear war. And my roommate said, this is the best the RAND Corporation could do? We better dig a bomb shelter. <laughs> true, true story. I, uh, I, I think that letter may still be in my garage. I, I was sort of interested in what it might get on eBay. Um, here's one that I like. Chewbacca. Star Wars, Chewbacca, remember? Uh, Chewbacca was named by Entertainment Weekly as one of the greatest sidekicks in film history. I don't know if that says much about sidekicks. So he's this 200-year-old Wookiee, whatever that is, he kind of this hirsute biped. And it always struck me as odd that people would accept this. Because imagine, you go to Hobby Airport, you get on a plane, you're up at 40,000 feet, and the, <laughs> the co-pilot comes on to tell you about the weather, where you're going to be landing, and all that stuff. And it turns out he isn't even the same species as the passengers. Would you accept that? that I don't know. Uh, all aliens in rubber suits. When I was a kid, they were, all, they were always just guys in rubber suits, because that's the only way they can make them. But today, of course, they can make them any way they want. But they don't. You notice that. If I ask you to draw an alien, just grab the next 10 people off the streets of Houston, <laughs> if you dare to do that. And do that and say, OK, you know, one third of Americans think the aliens are here. That's true. They call me up every day. I get every day phone calls about that. Uh, what do you think the aliens look like? And they all draw, you know, sort of this uh, kind of oval head with the big black eyes and, you know, small nose, small mouth, and small bodies, no hair, no, no clothes, no pants, no sense of humor, whatever. <laughs> they all look like that. And, you know, th that sounds, I mean, that sounds very unimaginative. And, uh, I, but I was talking to a biologist about this, and she said, look, Sad, don't you understand what that is? And I said, well, I don't know. It's an alien. No. What that is is a projection of what we think we are going to become, right? 
We're losing our hair. Well, these guys have lost all their hair, right? We're losing our olfactory sense. These guys have small noses, right? We're, we're uh, you know, in the future, nobody's going to be loading trucks for a living. They're all going to be sitting around designing websites. So they need those big eyes, and that's all. <laughs> so that's what it is. Well, you know, I, I was very easy to criticize Hollywood about this. God darn it. Can't you think of anything better? But it turns out that there's a lot of practical value in having aliens that look sort of like that. Because it saves the screenwriter the backstory, right? If that, if, that, if that alien looked like a 10 speed bicycle, I mean, you'd have to explain, what is it? I don't know. What do you think? Maybe it looks like it came from outer space. I don't know. You could waste a lot of time trying to explain what it is. Whereas if he looks like your canonical alien, then it's all, all good. So th there is that. Um, faster than light travel by the 23rd century. Well, this is just what's called a dramatic necessity and a very obvious one. Our rockets, our best rockets, you all know about our best rockets, uh, take 75,000 years to go to Alpha Centauri one way. And, you know, that's going to be really boring if you're in a middle seat eating peanuts. So, <laughs> you know, they, in order to keep the episodes manageable in length, they have to have superluminal transport and so forth. Okay, that's just a trope that's unavoidable. But on the other hand, um, I think it says something important. A lot of stories are about galactic empires striking back or whatever they're doing, <laughs> our foundation, right? Uh, and in a sense, it does, well, I don't think that works. It doesn't make sense. At least if Al Einstein is right and you can't send in information any faster than the speed light, it's very hard to keep an empire together if communication takes, you know, at, at worst, 100,000 years one way, right? That, that's, I mean, imagine it. You know, you're in sector nine of the galaxy, wherever that is. And somehow the Klingons are mounting an attack. So you send a just SOS to Battlestar Galactica or whatever, right? And uh, hey, look, they're on an attack here. We need some help. Right? But unfortunately, Battlestar Galactica is, you know, 5,000 light years that way. That isn't very far, but 5,000 light years. So it takes 5,000 years for, for them to get the message. Hey, these guys are under attack. Well, call up Scotty in the engine room. Put the pedal to the metal. Let's get over there. And, you know, they can go almost the speed of light, right? So it's another 5,000 years for them to get over there. 10,000 years have gone by. Whatever the Klingons had on their mind, they've, they've done it. They've done it. <laughs> in fact, everybody in that sector probably now is a Klingon. Okay, so there's that. But there is this, which is kind of a corollary of that. And that is, I don't know if you remember in the first Star Wars, I think it was the first Star Wars, the Mose Eisley canteen scene, one of everybody, everybody's favorite. You know, everybody's sitting around playing strange instruments, having a beer, having a brew with one another. And yeah, they look odd, but you know, they can all, why can't we all just get along? Well, they can all get along. Doesn't make any sense. Right? Nobody knows how many societies have been born in the Milky Way galaxy, but let's say it's a million over the course. I mean, you could even, well, let's say it's a million. That makes it easy. Well, the, the, the galaxy is, you know, 10 billion years old. So that means <laughs> any two of them are at least 10 million years on average separated in time, right? So the idea that they can all share a brew and enjoy the same music that's like you having a social life with, you know, trilobites. I mean, I mean, maybe you do, but if you do, get help. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, actually not, because if, they, if you really have trilobites, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so, th so this is the fundamental error that Hollywood invariably makes when it comes to aliens. And they can't get away from this. It's, again, something that the stories disappear. But this is, this is fundamental, and that is that any aliens we encounter, and we usually encounter the ones that are kind of ornery, are more or less at our technical level so that we can take them on and win, usually, on the basis of what? You know, love or, or <laughs> bravery or just plain guts, something typically human. Now, you're taking on a society that has the ability to come here from light years away, right? Any real encounter, I mean, I've been on TV shows where they'll ask you, so how do you think we ought to defend ourselves? What would you do if the aliens, you know, mounted an invasion of Earth? So, I'd buy a lot of frozen pizza, grab some woman, and head for the hills. <laughs> They're going to hang around here. Because whatever they want to do, they can do it. It's, it's going to be like those Klingons. Uh, if, if there really were an invasion of Earth, if they actually came here, it would be Bambi meets Godzilla. <laughs> and we're the ungulates, right? <laughs> so, so that's, yeah, there's that. OK. Um, by the way. Here, here's, a, here's a subject that actually is very au courant, and that is the, the, the question of whether we should do more than, you know, my job is, I direct the SETI operation at the SETI Institute. So my job is to direct people to put on earphones and listen for ET, except we don't use earphones, of course. 
that thing. I, you, you may have heard al already about that. I've talked about it here six months ago. Joe Tarter probably talked about it more recently than that. But there are some people who want to broadcast. Think, look, let's not just be passive about this. Let's actually talk to the aliens. And there's a lot of objection to this. This is a very, very emotional subject, right? There, there are people who say, don't do that. Even Stephen Hawking is sort of weighed in on this. They who say, look, that just tells them we're here. And maybe 99% of them are all peaceable. And they just, you know, contemplate their navels or play with we or whatever. Uh, whatever. Maybe. But if 1% of them are aggressive, or 1% of all species, more than 1%, essentially all species, are slightly aggressive, then, you know, they might come here and destroy the place. And your tombstone will read, if you broadcast into space, your tombstone will read, responsible for the obliteration of Earth. <laughs> right? Um, well, maybe. I'm not going to get off on this subject, but it is, in fact, a, a, a very serious discussion. My response to it, I, I actually wrote something in the New York Times in March about this, that if you're going to worry about this, don't. If you're worried about, you, Andrew was worried about his dental appointment today. Worry about that, okay? <laughs> because, you know, the Hobby Airport has these radars, and it's easy to show that any society that has the technology to come here and ruin your whole day by incinerating the place has the requisite instruments to pick up our radars. Okay, so we're already telling them we're here. It's too late if you want to worry about that. Okay, uh, now, does Hollywood worry about any of this? I mean, getting the science wrong. In the old days, they didn't worry very much about it, actually. I mean, look, you're sitting in a movie theater. The film's coming off the supply reel, 24 frames a second. That's 90 feet a minute for 35 millimeter film. 90 feet a minute. And you're sitting there, and you're watching it, and saying, well, hey, well, that didn't seem right. Well, too bad, because it, it just keeps coming off the supply reel. There's nothing you can do. But today, you're sitting at home with your Blu-ray player, right? Hey, did you see that, Ralph? And then back it up, and then bang it up, and play it 20 times, and say, that's a mistake, right? And then you go on your blog, <laughs> and suddenly it's tweeted all over, hey, look at this funny error that they made in this film. $300 million, and they couldn't get it right. So the nitpick Nazis can get in there, right? And it maybe it doesn't affect box office very much, but it might affect box office 1%, conceivable. That some people say, well, it, it, obviously it's a stupid film, right? So there is a financial incentive for them to get it right. Uh, there's also the fact that getting the advice that might forestall these elementary errors has now become free thanks to the National Academy of Sciences. The National Academy of Sciences is a prestigious organization downtown DC, and they recognized something about five years ago that everybody in this room probably knew 50 years ago if you were alive then, and that is a lot of scientists and engineers go into their field because they've gone to cheesy films or seen stuff in TV, right? Okay, so they figured, well, yeah, okay, if they got the science right, just think how many more would go in. Okay, now that's the premise. And I'm not sure that the premise is correct. I may come back to that. Um, it, it, <laughs> I think about it, it kind of reminds me of when um, uh, James Cameron, who made Titanic, as you know, when James Cameron had some conversation with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they were talking about the, the night scene where you see the Titanic slowly sinking, and there are the sky, the stars of the sky wheeling overhead, and the stars are wrong. They're wrong. And Tyson points this out. He said, you got them backwards or something. I don't know, they, they weren't right. And Cameron responded to Tyson by saying, you know, that film made $2 billion worldwide. Just think of how much more it would have made if we'd only gotten the stars right. <laughs> Thank like that. OK, so, so in, that sense, in that sense, I'm not sure that getting it right really matters. But I am part of the list that they have. When they hear that there's a producer, director, writer, who's going to write some sort of sci-fi thing, they'll say, do you want to talk to an actual scientist about this? And they'll say, what is it going to cost me? Nothing. Well, sure. So, so they'll do it. They'll do it for an afternoon or an hour or a phone call or something. Okay. So I'm on their list of people that they bring in. And occasionally, they fly me down to LA. Or sometimes people come up from LA. Or sometimes they'll just call me up on the phone. And I, I always enjoy doing this. I have to say, I, I'd be lying if I said I don't enjoy it. And, and the, but usually, they're just interested in plot devices that you have to solve a problem for them. They said, look, we've got to get these astronauts you know, by, by behind the moon or something so that they can't hear us and, and whatever. They've got a storyline problem. They want you to solve it. Or they ask one of three questions. Now, I tend to get the, the alien films, of course. So uh, the first question is, why are the aliens here? What's motivated them to come to Earth? And that's a good question, for which there's really no good answer. Right? In the movies, very often they've come, well, they come from the water. But 
That doesn't make any sense. You know it. There's more water on you know, Europa, twice as much, as there is on Earth. Nobody's going to fight you for it. right? Uh, three quarters of the universe by weight is hydrogen. And the third most common element in the universe is oxygen. So hydrogen, oxygen, there's water all over the place. They don't need to come here for the water. Okay. So what else? Well, maybe they're coming from the molybdenum. No, well, you know, they've got molybdenum. <laughs> they don't, you know, they, well, they, they come here for breeding experiments. And, you know, people like that idea because they're just hoping to improve their own social lives. <laughs> Haven't had a date in 30 years, but there's this alien who's interested. So, okay, well, obviously they're not going to work. <laughs> obviously not going to work. And probably uncomfortable, too. I mean, do you, are you going out into the backyard and abducting the click beetles for breeding experiments? If, if you are, get help. You're not doing that. You're not doing that because, I mean, and even though you share DNA with the click beetle, right? So it doesn't make any sense. The only good reasons I can think of, actually, are maybe it's just a, it's a field trip for researchers. Maybe they're just interested in the science, right? Like little E.T. came to pick some plants, ended up playing with the kids, but he started out picking plants. So he was just researching. Or proselytizing. That might make sense. A lot of, you know, sort of the forgotten areas of the world were first visited by missionaries who were going there to proselytize. So maybe the aliens would come here just to have you join the galactic church. Okay, so I, I can talk to them about that. I say there really isn't very, there aren't very many good reasons why they might come here, but these are the best I can offer. And they shake their heads knowingly, and then they go back to, why don't they come for the water? Okay. <laughs> the, the, the second question they ask is, so uh, what weapons are they going to have? <laughs> this is really nutty. And these guys are centuries, millennia farther along technologically than we are, because they've come here, right? And so asking what kind of weapons they have would be like asking Julius Caesar. So what do you say, Julius? Uh, what do you think the US military will have in its arsenal in the year 2015? Right? How good is Julius' answer going to be? Well, I don't know, bigger spears? <laughs> There's no way, no way to know. And the third question always is, so what do they look like? Right? It's another one you can't answer. I can say, well, you could use the little gray guys. Everybody uses the little gray guys, and they have certain advantages. But, you know, there's no reason that they would look like us, in my opinion. In my opinion. You go down to the local zoo, and unless you stumble into the primate house, they don't look like you. They look like giraffes or fish or snakes or whatever. And those, everything in the zoo, everything in the zoo, except maybe some of the bacteria. There are a lot of bacteria in the zoo. But aside from those guys, everything that's actually in a cage or a tank or a, you know, those enclosures, whatever, all those guys, I'm sure, more than 95% of their DNA is identical to yours, or at least 92%. Okay. So they're almost you, but they don't look like you. So why would the aliens look anything like us? They probably wouldn't, except that there are some people who think, no, no, that's not true, because you're actually a good design for an intelligent being. To begin with, you've got a head. Probably never thought about it, but you do. And you know, not everything has a head, but having a head is useful because you know, it gets all your sensory organs, A, up high, where it makes it easier to catch dinner or avoid being caught for dinner. And it, it puts your brain next to your sensory organs, which is good because nerves are very slow. You know, and that way you can maybe react more quickly. So, you know, so maybe they'll have a head. Eyeballs, eyeballs have been invented, I don't know, at least eight times by evolution. Right? So eyes are a great thing to have if you're on a planet around a bright star. Okay? And uh, so they'll probably have eyes. One eye is good, a lot better than zero. Two eyes is better than one because you have stereo vision, and now you, you, know, you might be able to catch something. All these sort of things, you can make these arguments. So to say that maybe they'll look something like us. I don't, I don't buy it, but there are, there are at least some evolutionary biologists say, well, well, maybe they look something like us. Uh, I don't know, but let me suggest to you what the real aliens would look like. Because one of the big things we're going to do in this century is invent synthetic intelligence. Right? So we invented radio, say practical radio, 1900. By 2100, we'll have AI, maybe strong AI. You can dispute that. We can talk about it later. But let's say it's true. And the first thing you ask that thinking machine, remember, in 20 years, your laptop will have more compute power than a human brain. It's just you know, raw compute power. It doesn't mean it thinks, but that's a software problem. So let's say by 2100 you've done it. So within 200 years of inventing radio going on the air, you have a thinking machine. And the first thing you ask it to do is uh, design something smarter than you are. And then you build that. And then you say, design something smarter than you are to that thing. And it builds that. And pretty soon it's building its own successors. It's not listening to you anymore. It doesn't care what you, what you think or what you want it to do. It does its own thing. Now, if that's going to happen to us, I, don't hope, I hope this doesn't disturb you in any way. Uh, but if that's what we're going to do, they've already done that. 
So the actual aliens are probably not going to be these soft, squishy little gray guys with the big eyeballs. They're going to be thinking machines. All right, let me tell you a little bit about my experience with The Day the Earth Stood Still and actually advising people who are making a sci-fi film. This was the remake of The Day the Earth Stood Still, not the original one with Michael Rennie, which, by the way, was a lot better. Uh, this one had Keanu Reeves and, and, and uh, John Cleese and Ken, uh, Jennifer Connelly, who had more IQ than the rest of the cast put together, I have to say. <laughs> but they, they, you know, they, Jennifer Connelly would call me up a couple of times to get the jargon of astrobiologists, and they flew me up to the set uh, in Vancouver when they were doing the interiors. And there's a scene, for any of you who've seen the movie, you know, the, the aliens have come here because we're wrecking the planet, okay, as if they care. But they're, they're, we're wrecking the planet, and they want to save the planet by getting rid of the one species that's causing all the trouble. And it turns out <laughs> that's not hamsters, it's us, okay. <laughs> but at the last minute, th th we get saved because the alien is taken to some physicist's house where the guy is, you know, working out physics. They say, well, any species that's interested in theoretical physics is worth saving. I don't know if you buy that, but that's what it was. <laughs> okay, so in the scene, you know, th th there's this big blackboard in John Cleese's house. And it's got to have these equations that the alien has to fill in the last term of. And the director said, come up with the equations, Seth. Well, I'm not really a theoretician, but I, I talked to a lot of theorists, uh, theorists, and we came up with some general relativity equations that, you know, even the aliens might be interested in and so forth and so on. We went around three times on these equations before the director was satisfied, right? I'm sure that his, his knowledge of physics equations probably did not extend to F equals MA, but nonetheless, we went around three times, okay? And so I get up there on the set, and he says, all right, you got to put these equations on the blackboard. So if you see the film, all the equations on the blackboards are written in my handwriting. And not only that, there's secret messages. It's like philately. There's secret marks and stuff like that that I put in just for my own amusement. Uh, and then the equation that the alien had to finish, what they did is they traced it in pencil, traced my chalk in pencil. Then they erased the equation. And then Keanu Reeves, the alien, has to just write that in by tracing over the pencil because he can see it. The camera can't. Okay, so I'm sitting there watching this. You know, he does it, and then they, you know, shift the lights and get coverage for the editor and shoot it from a different angle, and he does it again. Doesn't. But Keanu Reeves, and he was just lambda, mm -hmm. uh, like that. And I go, over, <laughs> I go over to the director, Scott Derrickson, and I say, you know, Scott, I'm a little worried. Keanu Reeves is writing those Greek letters so slowly, it looks like he does, he's never done any science before. And Derrickson looked up at me and said, look, Seth. He's an alien. Of course he writes Greek letters slowly. <laughs> Just a, a little bit more. They, they, they sent me the script. The first thing they did is they sent me the script. And they said, make the dialogue sound like real scientists. They said that, but they didn't want that. Because I did. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they took maybe 30% of what I said and, and did incorporate it. But, but there was a line there near the beginning of the film where the, the original script read, Professor Fudnick, or whatever his name was. Professor Fudnick, there's a bolide on a hyperbolic trajectory uh, entering the inner solar system at three times 10 to the seventh meters per second. So I just crossed that out. And I wrote, Bob, there's a goddamn rock headed our way. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if, if you go see the movie, what you'll hear is, Professor Fudnick, there's a bolide on a hyperbolic trajectory. <laughs> It, it was all that. And, and actually, toward the end of the filming up in, the, in Vancouver, you know, I, I did go up to Derrickson again, and I said, you know, you have me correcting all these minuscule things in, this, in, the, in the script here, in the dialogue and on the whiteboard and all that stuff. And I said, but the fundamental premise of this film is bonkers. <laughs> it was a very daring thing for me to say, but it was toward the end of my <laughs> visit there. And he, again, he looked up at me and he said, Seth, Fox signed off on this script six months ago. You're not going to change the premise now. So I didn't. OK. Well, much as it's fun to find fault with sci-fi, uh, I think that maybe it doesn't matter so much. I, I admire the National Academy of Sciences trying to get the science right. And there was a, there was a uh, poll taken, I don't know, a couple of years ago, apparently. I never saw it, actually, that said that 90% of Americans get the majority of their science training from Star Trek. I don't know if that was true or was apocryphal, but in any case, if it was true, I thought I'd at least try and get it right. But, and, and, but then I, I talked to somebody else who also advised on science films, and he had advised on these uh, two films that were made about asteroid impacts, you know, Deep Impact and Armageddon, and how much of it was wrong. 
right? Here's an asteroid the size of Texas. We see it at the last day, right? <laughs> it's probably, probably not right. But it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Does it affect anything? No. And so, so that's what we were arguing. It's great to get it right, but really, you're not going to see a kid watching a film in which the X-wing fighter goes whoosh as it goes by the camera and say, that's it, Mom. There was a whoosh. I'm not going into science now. I'm going to become an English lit major. Huh. It's, you never hear that. And so that we felt pretty, pretty uh, confident that we had it right, that it doesn't matter. But then a guy got up from UCLA's medical school. And he said, yeah, well, that may be true if you're talking about you know, space opera, but it's not true for medical films. And he had some interesting examples, which I won't belabor here, but which he pointed out that, you know, you see House or somebody, and he's treating some patient who's got this dread disease. Your Uncle Sidney has that same dread, dread disease, but House cures that guy, and your Uncle Sidney's not getting better. And he said, there's real danger. He, he talked about a film in which a woman had an ultrasound. She was pregnant, and, you know, the kid was going to have Down syndrome, and should she carry it to term or not? And she decided to carry it to term, and then the kid became a musical prodigy, and, you know, uh, was better than Yasha Heifetz, or I don't know what a, and he said, you know, that was that kind of irresponsible because, yes, that occasionally happens, like one time in 10,000 or something like that. So he said there were real consequences in medical films, but not in space opera. Okay, uh, so I could say, in general, I don't think it actually matters if it's wrong. I would argue that, that it really doesn't matter if it's wrong, uh, except for, A, as I say, to the extent that people get their science information from, from these films. And secondly, there's the, the perception of the practitioners and the participants of science. What is the American view of scientists? Well, when I was a kid, scientists were just, I mean, the scientist in every film was this short, bald guy in a white lab coat with few, show, few social skills, zero sex appeal, and a beautiful daughter, right? <laughs> and, and no wife. And I figured, okay, he's just been transplanted from that, that, uh, that ranch <laughs> in western Nebraska, whatever. There he is. That's the way it used to be. Now, but that's changed. You know, I thought, that's not a very good way to portray scientists. He was always running around saying, don't shoot the monster. We've got to save it for science. Meanwhile, the monster's devouring lower Manhattan. Okay, so, and, and that's because America has a, ten, a, a tradition of anti-intellectualism. America is very suspicious of intellectuals because those aren't our heroes. This is not Europe, right? Those aren't our heroes. Our heroes are the guys who could walk across the Appalachians and take on a bear or the natives or whatever in the Wild West. Those are our heroes. And that's why the intellectual is the little bald guy with a white lab coat and so forth. But that's changed recently. That's changed. And I have to say that, to me, that's a good change. Because the rise of nerd dumb has, has changed our perception. I mean, you think of Blacklist, if anybody watches Blacklist. Who's the real hero there? It's the computer guy. Right? He's the one that actually solves all these things. Uh, there's also the perception of what science can do. And that's, uh, as I say, I think that is influenced by science fiction. Uh, will we ever go to the stars? I think most of the populace assumes we will because they've seen it a hundred times in the movies, right? Going to the stars, it, it's just a matter of getting whatever warp drive is and put your pedal to the metal, you know, we need dilithium crystals, something. Uh, yeah, and yet if you ask scientists their opinion on this, most of them would say, you know, it's a really good chance we'll never go to the stars, <laughs> okay? And so, but it's probably better to have the attitude that maybe we will go to the stars. I think that uh, that's okay. In my own occupation, I think there is an effect. Uh, what do we do in SETI, where we're trying to eavesdrop on, you know, signals being broadcast by other so societies? Typically, we point our antennas in the direction of what are called habitable, plan habitable planets. Now, the planets are somewhat like the Earth, with liquid oceans, atmospheres, that sort of thing. Or if we don't know where they are, and we only know about, you know, three dozen of them, we point them in the direction of stars that might have planets like that, or we hope that they have planets like that. We're trying to find Earth 2.0 and look at enough of them that we finally trip across one that has somebody broadcasting on it. But I've just given you the scenario of what we're going to do in this century. See, that, that scenario is encouraged by what you see in the movies. Because there, the aliens are always soft, squishy, protoplasmic beings. But I've already explained to you how that might be way wrong, that the majority of the intelligence in the cosmos is not protoplasmic. It's not biological. It's synthetic intelligence. And yeah, maybe in its memory banks, it knows somewhere, yeah, we we arose from this sort of gooey, dirty chemistry a long time ago. Anybody remember that? No, I don't remember it. Okay. Uh, you know, but we continue to point our antennas in the directions where we think the soft, squishy guys may be, and that might be a real mistake. Well, we all want to know the future. Consider the, uh, the appeal of fortune tellers, astrologers, seers, psychics, all that. Um, 
Sci-fi sci is just another way to visualize the future. Uh, and and, and it, it addresses themes that are perhaps even more important than whether you're gonna meet somebody really hot this weekend, right, or you're gonna come into big money. Sci-fi only makes sense, of course, and you may not have thought about this, but sci-fi only makes sense if there is progress in societies. Right? It wouldn't have made sense a thousand years ago. To begin with, there wasn't any sci, but sci-fi wouldn't have made sense because if you were lucky, the next generation was gonna be like you. Right? If, if your kids survived infancy, you, know, you can hope that they could take over the farm and be like you. Or go back to ancient Egypt. The this, this society was static for thousands of years. Every generation was like the previous generation for thousands of years. That was the general run of things for almost all of the history of Homo sapiens. And it's only since really the Renaissance when suddenly we had this idea of progress. And then sci-fi makes sense. Because it's maybe not unreasonable to assume that by the 23rd century our descendants will have lifestyles that are radically different than ours, for better or worse, okay? So, although most science fiction, cinema science fiction in any case, is usually only a small extrapolation, 10, 20 years into the future sometimes, they pretend it's longer, but it's usually, if you look at it, you see, you know, that's all stuff we'll probably have in the next 50 years. Uh, in general, you know, it's still better than your average ISO astrologer, so maybe it's worth looking at. And for kids in particular, what they see in a sci-fi film, that's not some future that might or may not happen. That's their adulthood. That's the way they're looking at it. That's the way they're looking at it. We go to the sci-fi film for many reasons. For one, just to see the future visualized for us. I go for the special effects, right? It's always great to see what the future might look like, whether it's utopian or dystopian. But I think, you know, when you get right down to it, science fiction at your local multiplex, multiplex is just a crystal ball. And after all, who could resist looking into a crystal ball? Well, thank you very much for paying attention. All right, thank you very much. So we'll take a couple of questions in here, and then we'll uh, take it over to uh, Overflow, see if they have any. So, all right. Just don't ask, ask me about plot lines or you know, <laughs> Star Trek or anything. So it's always fascinating to me, the difference between a documentary and a movie. And so if, if you call something a documentary, uh, it seems to me, now you've got to be really factual. Now you've got to get it right. Have you found that to be true? Have you worked on a documentary and all of a sudden now it's a different uh, plane? Well, I, I have been on a lot of, uh, yeah, the question is, are documentaries different than you know, science fiction? Uh, at some level, I suppose they are. But I've been on a lot of shows that you see, for example, on Fox about ancient aliens. There's one I've been on, I don't know, how many times I've been on. Is that a documentary? I mean, it's kind of presented as if it's a documentary, see? But it's really docudrama. And most of what you, you hear in that is, I mean, the people who are saying these things are certainly sincere. So from their point of view, it's a documentary. But from most scientists' point of view, this is all fiction. So I, I don't think that the boundary is very clear, actually. I think that the it's really a continuum. That's an easy thing to say. But I really think there is a continuum. A lot of what passes for being a documentary on television is anything but factual. Be, you know, I, I always tell people, remember, it's only television. It's television. These people are not in the science education business. What up? Okay, let me, let me just very quickly summarize the comment because the gentleman didn't have a microphone there. Uh, he says, it's a, I, I was not very careful in my portrayal of what a uh, crystal ball viewer, some, some, a fortune teller would be. A fortune teller is different than a, a futurist, if you will, because they're not trying to predict the future. They're simply trying to tell you information that might be of use to you if you put it to use. And I agree, that, that's true. I, I actually went to, for our radio show, I went to, a, 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 I guess, a fortune teller 
and she said things like, you probably like people and stuff like that. It was, it was, I wasn't, you know, I, I don't know, it wasn't terribly useful. But I mean, you know, and I had an astrologer test my horoscope. And the astrologers, you know, they'll say, okay, so when were you born? And I right, assign a planet. And as you know, the office building across from the hospital where you were born has more, for example, of a gravitational pull on you as a kid than, you know, Jupiter does, but never mind. Uh, but, and, and they say things like that, but they were very general. And I thought, you know, what would convince me that there was something to all that is if I could have gone to the astrologer and said, look, here's my personality. You know, I'd like this, and, and then they say, okay, you were born on July 20th. You know, if they could do that, then I'd be convinced. The uh, guy in the uh, Ten Commandments with the watch on, he was the time traveler, right? You want to talk about time travel movies? Yeah, maybe that was it. I like that. I never saw that watch. I you know, saw the Ten Commandments. Shane, any Chucky questions has. in the overflow room? We have three questions. Hi, Dr. Uh, one question I have is um, with SETI, I know that you guys use our uh, try to receive radio wave, but um, what about other uh, EM uh, and EM spectrums? Do you guys try and do you know, back waves and all that other stuff? Yeah. Sure, good question. Uh, well, actually, the antenna we use, the Allen Telescope Array, it works in the microwave region of the spectrum. So it's, it's from 1 to 10 gigahertz. So that's microwaves. Right? That, that's, uh, what is that? That's 20 centimeters to 2 centimeters, that kind of thing. But there are SETI experiments that uh, look for flashing lights in the sky. Uh, there's one done at the University of California at Berkeley, and there's one at Harvard. Okay? And so they use very, for the techno types in the audience, they use very fast detectors, photomultiplier tubes. They put them behind a telescope, and they look for flashes of light. They have a bunch of photomultiplier tubes to avoid you know, interference by cosmic rays and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot of that kind of worry in it. But the idea is that, and, and I think that this is a legitimate thing to say. I don't think the aliens know we're here. We've been broadcasting into space since the Second World War at high-powered, high-frequency signals that they might be able to pick up. Okay. But that means those early episodes of Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, or whatever, there's 70 light years out there. Okay? And so if the aliens are more than 35 light years away, you know, they haven't had enough time to pick up I Love Lucy, decide they don't like Fred Merce's jokes, and then send something back to us. Right? Well, within 35 light years, there aren't that many star systems. You know, there are a few thousand, but that's it. So it's, uh, I think it's very unlikely anybody knows we're here. So one thing they might be doing is they know that there's oxygen in our atmosphere. They can know that no matter where they are, because that signal's been going out into space for two billion years and more. And so they say, well, you know, Zork, whatever the guy's name, Zork, it's oxygen. So they, at least they've got lettuce. I tell you what, maybe they have something more than lettuce. Let's send them a ping once every two weeks, just a flash of light in the sky, and see if anybody gets back to us. And we'll do not just them, but we'll do 100,000 other planets. So that might make sense. It might be a high school science fair project for the Klingons. And <laughs> so we do look in the light. Uh, so that, and also infrared a little bit. So those are the regions of the magnetic, electromagnetic spectrum where we look. Good question. Two more questions. Okay, um, can the inclusion, the occasional inclusion of an error in a movie, a scientific error in a movie, not cre create more scientific dialogue than if the movies were always perfect? So wouldn't it be a good thing that occasionally you get errors and then people talk about it? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think I, I, think I buy into that. I, I think I'm going to give them bad advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's certain truth to that. Okay. Uh, one last question, Dr. Shostak. Um, with the Drake equation, even if you're putting conservative numbers, the galaxy may have you know, a few hundred potential uh, intelligent life. But do you think with um, when Dr. Uh, Feynman, Richard Feynman, had made a, question, a statement about if there's all these alien life forms, where, where are they? Do you think that might suggest one that, um, might, or suggest that, I guess, um, intelligent life forms, you mean an uh, intelligent tool using life forms, extinctions probably get a, um, outpace them more so, more so than them spreading out and eventually reaching us, and that's probably why it might be silence here? Well, I appreciate the optimism of the guy asking the question. <laughs> We're doomed to self-destruct. Uh, I mean, you know, that could be. You, you invent radio, so you go on the air. But you invent that at the same time you invent the H-bomb, right? I mean, within 50 years, right? So, you know, maybe you go on the air for 100 years, and then you go off the air with all these mushroom clouds decorating your, your planet. Um, I, you know, 
I, I don't know, a couple of things. To begin with, um, I think you were talking actually about the Fermi paradox. I don't know that Richard Feynman said anything about this, but the Fermi paradox in which he said, look, if there really are a lot of civilizations out there, at least one of them would have colonized the galaxy by now. There ought to be aliens everywhere. And some people take that as good evidence for the fact there aren't any aliens anywhere. Right? I don't personally, because that's making a very big conclusion from a very local observation. Right? I looked out the, the, you know, the, the back door of my house two days ago. I didn't see any brown bears. Right? Now, brown bears have had plenty of time to get to the backyard <laughs> in the history of North America. Right? But I didn't see one. So should I conclude there are no brown bears in North America? You see, so, so I, I don't think that the Fermi paradox actually says very much. As far as the Drake equation, you only get a couple of hundred. I, if, if you can ask Frank Drake what he gets from his equation, and he'll say uh, 10,000 societies are out there right now broadcasting signals that are going through your bodies as you suffer through this soporific presentation tonight. <laughs> okay. but if you, and now, Frank is a very smart guy. And usually when he says something, it's true. It turns out to be true. But I ask him, Frank, where'd you get this number? And Frank will tell you quite honestly that that is his best estimate, but that's a euphemism for guess. I mean, Carl Sagan was also a smart guy. He figured it was a few million. And there are people, I mean, you say a few hundred, there are people who figure it may be zero, that we're it. And we don't know. We simply don't know. We don't know the important terms in the Drake equation to make this estimate. This is one of those things where it's like sitting around in the bars of Europe in 1600, having a lot of beer, trying to decide, you think there's a continent at the bottom of the world? I don't know, Luigi, what do you think? I don't know, well, it would balance out these other continents. You could, you could, you could drink beer to the bovines return Shea New. You could, you could talk about it for a long time, but in the end, the only way you're going to answer that question is to send some ships down there and look. And it's the same thing when it comes to the Drake equation. You can wrestle with the Drake equation as long as you want, but in the end, I think you have to do the experiment. This is me talking, and th that's what we do, but I, I, I do think there's some truth in that. I'll take a couple more in here. Sorry. <laughs> Have you got a favorite sci-fi movie that you think got it right or very close to right? <laughs> I don't even like them when they get it close to right, to be honest. <laughs> Have you ever seen Zontar thing from Venus? They didn't get it right. Of course, I didn't like that one either. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I didn't talk about Contact because uh, I figured Jill did, but I was an advisor on that film. And uh, I thought that they got most of that right. But of course, that's not so surprising because Carl Sagan wrote the book. So in some sense, at least the first third of the film, the last third of the film, right? I mean, in, in the middle where you go to this, I don't know, she encounters the aliens and all that stuff, goes finds dad on another planet. None of that made any sense. Maybe the first third of the film was right, OK? The, the, the casting director came up to my office when they were shooting this film. And she said, all right, Seth, I, I'd like to see you engineers and scientists here. And I pointed to the door to my office and said, there they are. And so she disappeared for three hours. And then came back three hours later. And I said, did you learn anything? And she said, yes, two things. One, you all have fancy coffee mugs. <laughs> and, and sure enough, pay attention next time you see contact. And look at the coffee mugs of all the engineers. They're pretty fancy. <laughs> the second thing she learned after three hours out there in the wilds of the SETI Institute was, and I was impressed by the way you people carry your weight around here. And I thought, my god, she's tuned in to the SETI Institute's hierarchy and the management structure. But that was wrong. She said, you all have sedentary jobs. You're all kind of fat. <laughs> so pay attention to that. When you watch the film, notice the, the principles. That's not true. Matthew McConaughey is not bad. Jodie Foss is not bad. But all the technical types are all kind of on the heavy side. I know that didn't answer your question, but. I, I was uh, wondering if you could talk about some of what may be true or false in the scientific community regarding uh, scientific theories on time travel seen in movies like Terminator, or Back to the Future, what may be true or false in real life. Well, I think the answer to your question is that we don't know the answer to your question. Um, you know, time travel sort of works on blackboards, right? but it's not clear that not everything that works on blackboards works in the real world, okay? So it's, it's quite unclear, and there are objections to, uh, I mean, you know, Stephen Hawking would tell you, if time travel worked, you would see tourists from the future, and that kind of thing, which, of course, you do in the movies. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, most, I think if you took a poll of most physicists today, they would say, no, you can't 
You can go forward. We're all doing it. But you can't go backward. Right? You can go forward at different speeds, too. But you can't go backward. And that's what they would say. But I mean, nobody really knows. I, I, asked, I lived in Holland for a while. And I asked one of the theoreticians there about this. And he said, well, he said, if it were possible to do that, you might be sitting there. And some guy from the future would pop up in the chair next to you. He said, and that wouldn't be a nice thing to do to you. <laughs> so I took it from him that he didn't think it was possible. I'll take one more. One more. Oh, there was a gentleman here who had a question that actually, well, why don't you shout out your question, then we'll go to this guy in the back. Oh, it was the same? How did you do that? <laughs> Telepathy, it, it works. Psychological entanglement. Psychological entanglement. It's psychological entanglement. That's how we do oh, it. Oh, I see. Okay. You ought to go to Vegas. <laughs> What is your all-time favorite science fiction movie? Well, look, I'm old. So my. So am I. Yeah, well, no, but I'm thinking of the ones in my youth. And I like the original War of the Worlds because I thought it had a terror that the remake did not have. Because they were very clever about not showing the, the Martians until way into the film, and then only briefly. Maybe it was a matter of money, but I think that George Powell, who made that film, he was a Hungarian puppeteer, uh, actually uh, knew what he was doing. So there was, there was a terror. And once again, it was great to see L.A., you know, getting eaten up by the aliens. But, <laughs> but that's, a, that's a long time ago. More recently, I think the first alien film really impressed me. I went and saw that more than once, which I usually don't do. All right. Let's thank Dr. Shostak one more time.